Good evening and welcome. My name is Julie Diana Hench, and I am president of Penn's Association of Alumni. Tonight we are so excited to present Women Shaping a Better Tomorrow, the Association of Alumni's 100th Anniversary Colloquium. It is the culmination of our year-long celebration, marking the AFA's founding, its impact, and its pledge to keep honoring the past and engaging the future. Uh, before we, we begin, I'd like to direct your attention to a short video from Penn alumni president, Julie Platt. She was unable to join us this evening, but she recorded some remarks for us to see in her afternoon. Hi, I'm Julie Black, President of Penn Alumni, and I'm so happy to welcome all of you to this exciting event. Congratulations on your 100th anniversary of the Association of Alumni, and I hope we get to see you all and greet you at Homecoming, featuring arts and culture on Saturday, November 9th. See you then. <coughs> Our program tonight features TED style talks from three Penn alumni faculty. Dr. Beverly Willis Emanuel, Dr. Salome Shatillet, and Dr. Angela Duckworth. I will introduce each speaker before her presentation, and then at the end I'll open the floor to questions that any of you might have for our esteemed speakers. Um, my introductions are brief, so I encourage you to look through the program for their more complete bios. And I know you're anxious to hear from these fantastic women, as am I, so I'll get started. Our first speaker, who currently sits on the Association of Alumni's Board of Directors, uh, is Dr. Beverly Willis Emanuel, Professor of Pediatrics in the Genetics Department at the Carolyn School of Medicine, and she is also Chief of the Division of Human Genetics and Molecular Biology at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Beverly Willis Emanuel as she discusses using the power of genetics and genomics to solve medical mysteries. I want to thank you for inviting me here to this great group of women. And I will point out right before I start um, that I actually, um, if you look at your brochure, graduated from a school at Penn that no longer exists, the College for Women. We've come a long way. Um, what I want to talk about is using genetics. And I'm going to focus um, my attention on the heart and the brain at the end when I talk about some of the research that we are doing. So a brief history of DNA. Um, what you need to know is that in 1953, DNA, the structure, was discovered by Watson and Crick. A few years later, um, the number of chromosomes of man were discovered by Thiel and Levan. Until that time, in 56, we actually didn't know how many chromosomes we had. Several years later, in 1962, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Watson, Crick, and Wilkins for discovering the structure of DNA. And I'm focusing on DNA because obviously that's what we do in genetics. I will mention there's one person missing from that Nobel Prize, and that's Rosalind Franklin. She was the woman who actually did the X-ray crystallography that helped discover the structure. She was overlooked. Unfortunately, she died um, prematurely. She was quite young. In 1999, the first human chromosome was sequenced. I'm proud to say it was a chromosome 22. So myself, along with something like 160 of my closest colleagues, <laughs> um, published the paper in Nature announcing that we had finally sequenced one chromosome. And in 2003, the Human Genome Project was claimed um, to be completed. We selected 22 here, um, in part because they're not so um, <coughs> foolish. Um, it's one of the smallest chromosomes. And there was a history of studying chromosome 22. And I was particularly interested because these are several of the disorders that I will refer to that I study. And um, more recently, we've um, been very interested in the schizophrenia susceptibility locus that is probably somewhere on chromosome 22 as well. So DNA, the molecule of life, um, each of our cells, um, and we have trillions of cells, has 46 chromosomes into which two meters of DNA 
are wound. And this is 3 billion DNA subunits, the bases, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine. And there are roughly 30,000 genes that comprise the human genome that make up who we are and that actually um, perform all the functions that we need um, to do on a daily basis. So the question is, now that we have the sequence, can we figure out what leads to health or disease? So we know that, in fact, um, in the genome, um, if you have, say, this short stretch of DNA, um, you will get a perfectly fine protein produced. Some individuals may have a different base there, but it doesn't do anything to the protein. So these are what we call normal variants, and there are many, many. The estimate is we have one in every thousand nucleotides. However, if you substitute a different nucleotide, you wind up with a very defective protein that leads to disease. So we as geneticists have been looking over and over and over at multiple different proteins and multiple different diseases to figure out what causes disease. So what does this mean to us? What are the products of the Human Genome Project? Well, personalized medicine, and it's coming very quickly. Um, the project um, was launched over 23 years ago. Um, and in addition, it was predicted to need hundreds of sequencing machines and $3 billion to sequence a human genome. 13 years later, as I mentioned, the genome was completed. But coming soon, and coming, I know, in the realm where I work, is the $1,000 genome for diagnostic purposes. So think of medical tests. There are many tests that are done. But if you can sequence the genome for $1,000 and solve the disease, it's pretty amazing. Um, the technology, however, has accelerated so quickly um, that we can do this quicker than we can understand everything that the information tells us. And um, we have a lot to do. The analysis is very labor intensive and actually more costly than sequencing a human genome. And the question that comes up is, will our genomes ultimately be part of our medical record? And the answer is probably, at some point they will, encoded in a chip, and you'll walk around with it <laughs> when you go to the doctor. And we know already that there are certain treatment decisions that are made based on um, the genetic information. Certain breast cancers are treated based on whether they're HER2 positive. Um, there are um, variants in the human genome that don't affect anything except <coughs> sensitivity to the drug Coumadin. So many, many, many of these um, are happening. In addition, um, the ability to sequence the whole human genome cost-effectively is really <coughs> remarkable. It's going to lead to very precise diagnostics and targeted therapies. And there will be a lot of questions about this. We ourselves, as geneticists, are reeling over this. Because if you look at a child, you sequence the genome, but you find things that predict disease, what do you do with that information? So personalized medicine, um, there will be, I think, customized health care based on genetic or other information in additional patients. Um, oops, I didn't mean to go quite that fast. But risk predictions will be based on genetics, treatment decisions, more informed medical decisions, better outcomes, reduced probability um, of negative side effects. And we will be able to focus on prevention of disease, altering lifestyle, um, behaving in certain ways based on our genetics rather than reaction to, to disease. And this will lead, obviously, to earlier intervention. So um, the research in the future will be identifying genetic differences between people that predict susceptibility to disease. We all know about the identification of the breast cancer gene. Obviously, BRCA1 um, sensitizes women. People get tested for it. There will be many more like that. We will develop tests that predict whether an individual will develop a particular disease. And um, treatments can be offered to delay the onset of disease if we know all of that information. So for example, if we identify a genetic abnormality that causes disease, 
can we introduce new genetic material to correct or bypass that defect? So the idea of gene therapy, isolate a piece of DNA containing genes with normal function, take that DNA, put it in a viral vector, and then put that, um, or some other gene transfer tools, transfer that information to an individual with a disease and improve their disease. And in fact, at Penn and Chop recently, a gene therapy protocol was successfully carried out, and vision was restored to a nine-year-old boy. And I met this kid, and it's amazing. He couldn't see. He couldn't walk. He couldn't go into a room. He functions completely normally now. He was blind before the therapy. And now there are clinical trials ongoing for other diseases, particularly blindness. The reason why blindness is because the eye is a very protective environment. You can introduce a gene into the eye um, and not have to bypass all of the other organ systems in the body. But it's pretty remarkable. So um, this is what I actually study now, the 22Q deletion syndrome. It's a 3 million base pair um, deletion that occurs with a prevalence that's estimated in roughly 1 in 2 to 4,000 live births. We follow a cohort of over a thousand kids at CHOP. Um, these children have cleft palate, roughly 69%. Many are born with congenital heart defects, somewhere between 65 and 75% of these individuals. Why some and not all? We're interested in that. Um, they have learning disabilities, speech and language problems, immune dysfunction, but um, of great interest right now, as this population ages that we've identified, we realize that they have psychiatric abnormalities and are at an increased risk of schizophrenia. So where schizophrenia in the general population is roughly one in 100 individuals, these children um, develop schizophrenia 20 to 30% of them. So again, why some? and not all. They have characteristic facial features, and it's always nice to see these kids. They look perfectly normal. They're lovely children. And if you look, these are two babies. These are two teenagers. They look more like one another than they do their siblings. So a trained geneticist, dysmorphologist, actually can recognize some of the features, and I won't go into that um, at this moment. And because of this increased risk of schizophrenia, we are funded now by the National Institutes of Mental Health to search for markers and behavioral predictors of schizophrenia. And um, in addition, um, in this population of children, we're also funded by um, human development to look and see whether we can figure out genes that may predispose to cardiac defects um, in this population. So um, the brain and the heart. We know copy number variants, in other words, hunks of DNA, each of us has within our genomes, now that we can sequence the genome, we know pieces of DNA that are duplicated or deleted that don't cause any problem. They're what we call normal variants. They're different from one person to another. But we've started looking at the copy number variants in this population. And we found, so far, by looking at over 800 kids, there's one common copy number variant that's exclusively found in the children um, that have a cardiac defect. And now we have to go into animal models and see, can we figure out what it is about more of that gene that predisposes to an abnormal heart during development? We found several interesting copy number variants related to psychosis, but so far each one is unique, um, and we can't put our finger on any one specific one at this point in time. And so this makes us think that maybe this deletion in these children is what we call a first hit that requires one or more different changes in the genome to, um, for them to develop these other features, either psychopathology or a heart defect. And so we, have a, we still have a lot of work to do to figure all of that out. 
And we're very excited because we're about to launch into full genome sequencing of a group of kids, or actually young adults with the deletion, because we think we will also be able to target, um, find potential gene targets for the schizophrenia that's associated with the deletion. So that's just a little flavor of what um, genetics, genomics does and means. It's hard to do that in 10 minutes. <laughs> Did I go over? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. So um, my freshman year, I was dating a senior. He was a member of fraternity. And I had only had one uh, sexual interaction prior to the night I was with him. And he responded to my series, my persistent cry of no with the penetration of my body. And I often remember the clouded color of the room. I remember the Bob Marley music playing in the background. And I remember the tears streaming down my face. I also went to the Philadelphia Sex Crimes Unit and reported my story. And in 1992, no, the no means no rape clause did not exist. So in 1992, if you were sexually assaulted and you said no, um, 
they couldn't prosecute the person. It had to be accompanied by physical violence. My section, second experience with sexual assault took place, as I said, my junior year uh, when I was in a study abroad program in Nairobi, Kenya. And there, I wasn't dating the person, but I was um, kind of stuck in a situation where someone was supposed to take me home, a local Kenyan man. Um, and in that experience, uh, I was physically threatened. And I remember the Nairobi sky being replaced by his rage and, and his powerlessness um, and his sweat. And so it took me that experience for me to come forward and start getting healing and getting therapy and breaking my own silence, but also being connected to a group of other college students who were survivors of either sexual assault on campus or domestic violence. And so at that time at the University of Pennsylvania, we didn't feel like there was much recourse, whether it was in the city of Philadelphia or on our campus. But after I graduated, I did feel like I wanted to share my story and I found a larger community of survivors with whom I could communicate and connect. And so as a faculty member here, but also as an activist in the women's movement, a lot has changed in the epidemic of violence against girls and women, and a lot hasn't. So currently, every two minutes, someone in the, sexually, someone in the United States is sexually assaulted. So the time of my talk, we're gonna have about a 10 minute talk, five people will be sexually assaulted. Sexual violence is still the number one violent crime on college campuses. And one in four college women report being a victim of sexual assault or, or attempted sexual assault. And another thing that we do as, an, uh, as activists is that we often say, you know, turn to your left and turn to your right, because the numbers are even more staggering. One in three Americans has been affected by sexual assault or domestic violence. And in a room full of women, there are so many people who understand exactly what I'm talking about, but whether they've received resources or help may be a different issue, but all of us know someone who, who survived sexual assault. And so I think we're at a tipping point right now. There's a lot more conversation, a lot more discourse around sexual violence in the mainstream media, um, and yet there's also a lot of victim blaming that continues to go around on college campuses, um, in the halls of Congress, um, and just in terms of our college campuses, it's still very difficult for survivors to come forward and say that they've had this experience. And so as an organization, and I'll talk a little bit about my organization, the work we do, this is our theory of change. We have to change the conversation, you have to build a critical mass, and you have to create a movement. So what does that mean, change the conversation? As I said, there are conversations that are currently happening. In 2012, 2013, uh, for the first time in history since this, the Violence Against Women Act was passed, there was a stalemate in Congress. Uh, there were a series of Republicans who tried to block the reauthorization of the Violence Against Women Act. And their points were because it was expanding to LGBT communities, to undocumented women, and to Native Americans. Right now, there's a big debate. So if it's not just a Republican issue, there's actually a big debate right now in the military about changing um, how people can report the sexual assault. And so Democrats are actually, uh, two Democrats have been blocking uh, Kirsten Gillibrand's um, legislation to change how sexual assault survivors in the military can report their crimes. Currently, you have to go through the chain of command and sometimes you have survivors reporting their crimes of sexual assault to the very people who have sexually assaulted them. So this is the debate. And then if you remember what happened in Steuben Hill, uh, Steuben, um, Ville, Ohio, it's not simply in the military courts that we need to change the conversation, but also in the court of public opinion. The young woman, uh, young, she was a teenager who was sexually assaulted in Ohio, um, was oftentimes a victim of threats and also um, just general uh, discrimination and ridicule amongst her peers for coming forward and saying that she was sexually assaulted by very popular uh, high school football players. So there are a lot of people in the public who are changing the conversation. Melissa Harris Perry and MSNBC, Rosie Perez at V-Day, Ashley Judd, sex, sexual trafficking. Representative Gwen Moore, how do I do this green thing? Right there. She uh, actually s told her story of sexual assault in Congress to try to get, to persuade her fellow congressmen um, to pass VAWA. Uh, Michelle Knight is the woman who spoke out against Ariel Castro. She was the only, um, one of the three women who spoke out in court. And Zerlina Maxwell uh, actually was on Hannity and said instead of talking about the victims and what they can do to protect, uh, prevent sexual assault, why don't we start um, educating potential perpetrators on how they can stop raping. And so she got a lot of hate mail for trying to change the conversation. 
So 10 years ago, I started this organization with my sister called The Long Walk Home. And it started for a simple act. I was healing, and my sister wanted to help me heal. So she started photographing my recovery process. And so for 10 years, she's been following me with a camera. And, <laughs> so, and she's an amazing photographer, and she tells the story quite a little differently. And we created this multimedia program called Story of a Rape Survivor. So we've been going around college campuses, um, Doc, show, showing these doc, this documentary in many ways of my recovery, so how sexual assault affected my body image, how sexual assault affected my spirituality, how sexual assault af affected my romantic relationships, and how in the face of tragedy I was able to find my voice and eventually um, find a place of triumph over this. And it's a multimedia performance because we created a coalition of artists who not only bring my story to life, but layer my story of recovery with their own stories of survival and feminist activism and art. So this is how we've decided to change the conversation, by using the visual and performing arts and art therapy, and by also creating a more multicultural or more racially diverse and inclusive movement around sexual, ending sexual assault. And so you, you can change the conversation, and as a literary critic, I would say that's, that's doing a lot. But as an activist, I feel like we have to actually take it a step forward and create a, or build a critical mass. And so I just want to highlight two organizations that are doing a really good job. And this is a new generation. This is a Tumblr site where social media activists are, have created Project Unbreakable. Um, and you can see here that people are submitting photographs of words that their perpetrators said to them. And there are people, like, million, like thousands of people who are, um, it's okay, <laughs> submitting photographs of themselves with the language of their perpetrators. So trying to put the onus back on, on the perpetrators of violence. And then here, um, a lot of college students, and as alumni, it, it's an interesting position to be in, but alumni and, contem and, co and contemporary or current students are organizing all across the country, around the country using Title IX um, in order to sue the universities in, and to create a safer, uh, climate for female students. So you have alumni and current students working together from places like Amherst to Yale to Ober um, Oberlin, Occidental, and right here in Swarthmore. And finally, we wanted to create a movement, right? So we have the critical mass, you have people organizing, working together, but what does a real movement look like? And for us in Alamak Home, it's actually changing the face of leadership. So what we do is we go to the communities that are the most invis invisible in many ways and the most um, likely to experience these forms of violence and transform girls in that community into the leaders of the women's movement. And so we started a program called Girlfriends Leadership Institute. And these girls are not only taking on sexual violence, but they're taking on sexual harassment and street harassment and dating and domestic violence. And so they may not be survivors of sexual assault or domestic violence themselves, but they may know someone. And so they sign up for this program every year and they build cr and create campaigns in their communities and in their schools to end gender-based violence. This is uh, the One Billion Rising, and our girls were the only youth that were part of the movement in Chicago. And this is uh, legislation that's actually happening in Illinois right now, um, where young people are sending in their stories in order to create an act called the, there it is, Ensuring Success in School Act, uh, ESSA, that's really to protect uh, victims of domestic violence and sexual assault to create safe spaces in their schools. And so when you think of Chicago, you tend to think about gang violence, and we're really interested in thinking about how gender-based violence is also part of how children are experiencing violence in their schools and their communities. And so if I were with college students, I would say this is how you can make a movement at Penn. First, you have to believe survivors. It's important to know that the first person a survivor tells their story to will shape how they respond for the rest of their lives, right? That it'll shape how um, they recover. And then students, most students don't know their sexual assault campus policy. Um, most students do not take gender studies courses and don't have a theory of gender violence or patriarchy or know the long history of the women's movements and how we've gotten from no legislation to some legislation. Um, and then also obviously doing something about it. And as an organization, since we're art therapy based, as well as performing arts based, we believe that self-care is crucial to maintain your own sustainability in the movement, but also it's part of how survivors and secondary victims of uh, violence 
can actually thrive in the face of adversity. So thank you. Thank you so much. I also wanted to thank Barbara Bravo, who is a very active member of this group and got me here. Um, and uh, nobody ever asked me to talk about self-control, so given a little leeway, be choosing between grit, which I also think is great, and self-control, I went with um, my current research on this very important competence. Um, I'm going to fast forward to um, this is my title slide. You may have heard of the marshmallow task. Uh, even Barack Obama's heard of the marshmallow task. It is a classic study of self-control where children at age four are given the choice between one marshmallow now or two marshmallows when I come back in the room. And actually, the task is not about whether you choose two later or one now, because frankly, all the children say that they can wait patiently and they can uh, you know, get what they really want, which is two later. The real task is, having made that resolution, how long will you wait? And that is the essence of self-control. Not resolving to go on the diet, <laughs> staying on the diet. Not resolving to do your work when you get home you know, and you're tired, but, but actually doing it. So, uh, uh, so that's a little um, cartoon from The New Yorker, which sum summarized uh, Walter Michel's research, uh, which was the original scientific work quite nicely. The term delay of gratification comes from Freud. And if you read the introductory lectures on psychoanalysis, he says that the chief developmental milestone in the transition from childhood to mature adulthood is to, quote, renounce immediate satisfaction, to postpone the obtaining of pleasure, to put up with a little unpleasure, a word I love and is, you know, should be introduced in the 21st century, unpleasure, and to abandon certain sources of pleasure altogether, and to quote Frog, I've always wanted to make an academic citation of Frog from Frog and Toad, and here is um, citing Frog when he says, willpower is trying hard not to do something that you really want to do. The enemy is within. Uh, and actually in international and national US studies of children and adults, given a list of 24 good things to be, wise, funny, kind, generous, empathic, self-control universally rates 24 out of 24, the lowest <laughs> strength, no matter your age or nationality. Um, and um, I would like to really focus our, our, our discussion today on how much you can teach self-control, not only uh, as adults, but, um, but as children in particular. You know, what can we learn about this? And to quote Walter Michel, whose uh, research really got us all started on this in modern psychology, the most important scientific discovery, and he said this this year, um, about self-control is that it can be taught. So let me say what I think we can um, teach. So this is a model that I developed with Tamar Gendler, who is chair of the philosophy department at Yale and also James Gross at Stanford University. And we call it the process model of self-control. Um, the idea is this. You think about the words willpower and you think about actively resisting temptation in the moment. And that is part of willpower, but that's the very last stage of willpower. There are many things that both children and adults can do far in advance of encountering the brownie, the donut, the Facebook, you know, bravo for me, bravo TV. Um, uh, and, and these strategies that are deployed far in advance of temptation can be actually much more effective. So to start with the earliest group of strategies, you can select the situation that you are in. Some situations make it very easy to maintain self-control. Some situations thwart our self-control. So if you're an alcoholic, don't go to a bar. If you're on a diet, you know, don't go to uh, you know, a fancy restaurant. Um, for students in particular, I tell every undergraduate who works for me, oh, guess what? As part of the job, you have to sit in the first three rows of class. 
And they're like, you mean when I go to lecture? And I'm like, yeah, pretty much. Because when you sit in the back of class, this is a situation you've selected yourself into. And when you sit in the front of class, this is a situation you select yourself into. And it's just a lot easier to pay attention to your professors. In my class, I actually calculated the kids who sat in the first third of the lecture hall got 6% higher grades, final grade point averages, than those who sat in the back. OK. <laughs> Having selected your situation, you can modify it. You can change it to make things easier for you, not harder. Again, to give an exa uh, example from kind of the, the life of the student at Penn, <laughs> right? I actually once had a guest lecture. I went to the bathroom. I came back down, and I saw this, right? <laughs> eBay, Solitaire, Half.com, Facebook. I thought they were all taking notes. Um, apparently not. So, you know, modify your situation. If you close your laptop, if you make it, you know, 15 seconds for your laptop to warm up, it's just going to be a lot easier to resist um, eBay. OK, third class of strategies. We're getting closer and closer to temptation. And I would say that as we get closer and closer to temptation, by the way, these strategies become harder and harder to use because temptation becomes very strong. But you can change where your attention goes. In the early marshmallow studies, a key observation was that children who looked away from the treat were able to wait longer, right? So how can we get our teenagers to look away, look not at temptation, right? Temptation, get thee behind me, if any of you know that phrase. OK. So, um, I think I think that you know, students who, when bored, right, look away from the professor actually find it very hard to actually still stay engaged. So just there's actually a KIPP charter school that teaches slanting. That means uh, kids have to sit up, listen, ask and answer questions, nod for understanding, and crucially track the speaker. Your shoulders have to be facing the speaker at all times. Right? If it's somebody who's speaking in the class, you turn around and you face them. You turn around and face the professor. So put your attention on the professor. Put your eyes on them. It'll make the rest of it a lot easier. The last good strategy, the fourth bucket, really is cognitive reappraisal, rethinking the situation. The, the very last thing is response modulation. I'm not going to argue that that's very effective. Reappraising your situation. In a random assignment we st uh, study that we conducted with fifth graders, children were either given the opportunity to remember an angry memory and do what we all do, which is replay it in the first person through their own eyes. Half of the kids were randomly assigned to actually distance themselves, so cognitively reappraise the situation, pretend you're a fly on the wall. Think about yourself in the third person. Watch yourself in a YouTube video, which by the way, they were like, what? What? It's like a YouTube video. Oh, I get it. <laughs> right? So that's um, remembering an angry memory as your distant self would participate in it. And if children are able to do that simple little cognitive trick, they're able to reduce the amount of anger that they feel towards their protagonist um, and, in fact, make fewer blame attributions. Last and least is response modulation. This is really willpower, or as the Buddhists say, crush mind with mind. So just do it, or just don't do it, depending on what the self-control dilemma is. And we've all had to do this, but I would argue there's not much art in this, right? So if we're trying to teach ourselves and our kids to be effective, you know, shouldn't we hide the Halloween candy rather than stare at it and not eat it? Um, so that's the idea of the process model, that there are different strategies that you can use, but the earlier the better. A stitch in time saves nine. Whatever strategy children use, they need to plan for it. They have to actually think in advance, you know, I've got a, you know, this thing coming down the pike, you know, what am I going to do when in the face of X, Y, or Z? And so we also work on teaching kids plan making. This is a worksheet that we gave to fifth graders in Harlem. They made a wish. They uh, have to say what the best outcome would be if their wish comes true. They think about the obstacle that stands in the way. They don't like this part, but that's very, very crucial, right? I hate, you know, anybody hear that poster, if you dream it, you can achieve it? That is a quote from Walt Disney. I hate that poster. <laughs> I'm like, are you kidding? Life is so hard if you, I would wish you could dream it and then achieve it. How about if you dream it and then you identify the obstacles that stand in the way <laughs> and then you make a plan, execute the plan and reflect on whether it worked and start all over again and you do that a thousand times and maybe you can achieve it. So this is what we did with the children. They ended with an if then plan, if, when and where, then action verb. And we were able to increase their grade point average by half a standard deviation. The same for teacher ratings of conduct. Uh, and these teachers were blind to condition there was a very rigorous placebo control in this study, and we were able to increase their school attendance. They actually came to school more on time.
So I want to end with this slide from William James. In 1899, William James delivered a lecture series not unlike the present one, where he said, for the general public, what do psychologists have to say? And in this lecture series in particular, it was called Talks for Teachers. And he ended with this quote, our virtues are habits. So all these strategies eventually become habits. Our, vices, um, our virtues are habits as much as our vices. Our nervous systems have grown to the way in which they have been exercised. Just as a sheet of paper, once creased or folded, tends to fall forever afterward into the same identical folds. And I would argue that you know, we scientists are working on the strategies. It is the teachers and the parents who are the paper folders. Uh, we work very closely in partnership with them. Uh, so I will end there. And thank you very much for your attention. So now we have two working here. Oh, yes, thank you. And um, yes, I'd like to open up for questions from the audience. I have a question for Dr. Willis Mandel about the genetics. I thought I thought it was really interesting that you said now you can do a a thousand dollar sequencing, but that you're getting so much data that it's actually is it actually noise? Somewhat. No, it's actually not noise, but just imagine 3 billion A's, T's, G's, and C's. Then you have to take all of that and you have to do it over and over and over and organize it so that you can recognize what the strings are. Then you have to divide that up and figure out what are the genes and what aren't the genes, et cetera, et cetera, on and on. It is a huge computer generated and what we call, an, there's a new um, sort of realm called bioinformatics. These are um, the guys who, uh, girls, guys, whomever, who take this data and crunch it and put it into a usable framework for us. So it's not um, garbage, it's just taking it and understanding it and knowing out of those 30,000 or so genes that have variants in them, are they important variants? Are they mutations? Will they cause a problem? Or what we now know are DUSs, or variants of unknown significance, because we don't know everything yet. So we have a long way to go, but the capability is actually there to do it. Um, it's not quite at $1,000 yet, but it's getting there. It's but it, but it doesn't, the reason I'm asking this is because I'm, I'm in, the, in the internet, and we can get a massive amount of data on use on, like you say, web traffic. And you get all this data, but making meaning out of it. Like, I mean, you can reinterpret. There's the intellectual interpretation. You know, and that could go in several different ways. So I was wondering if you're also in that same case, or is it just a matter of being able to sort through all this data? It's a lot of sorting, and then it's a lot of the research that's yet to come to understand what all of it really means. Um, it's, it's a complicated process. The information that you get out is valid, but it's just a string of letters. And you need to be able to put those in their right perspective um, to have them make meaning, um, medical or research-wise, et cetera. It's, um, it's been quite a learning process for many of us. Um, yeah. I have a question for each of them, a quick question. Um, Dr. Willis, you did Angelina Jolie's decision in light of her genetic testing did that have an impact on your work or in the whole realm of genetics? And Dr. Tillett, there, it's very interesting. There was uh, on the SV or whatever, one of the, one of the most popular mm -hmm. TV series last night, mm -hmm. the perpetrator, the rapist, was a handsome young cop. Mm -hmm. And what happens when it's an authority figure mm -hmm. that's the rapist? Mm -hmm. And Dr. Duckworth. <laughs> <laughs> active mind. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Please, please. The one for you is, um, 
you have interviewed yesterday, uh, someone who started the, the Renfrew centers for, uh, you know, for, for eating disorders, bulimia and anorexia, and I, I don't think that that's covered with your strategies for self-control. What would you say about that? But, yes, but Bev, you can start. Okay. <laughs> now I have to remember what the question was. Um, so I think in general, Angelina Jolie probably made a very wise decision. The fact that she became public was really extraordinary and she needs to be credited for that. Um, it doesn't have direct impact um, per se on what I do because most of what we do deals with children. But I am certain that for people dealing with um, breast cancer risk, et cetera, and counseling um, women and some men, but uh, counseling for what to do if you find that you have this mutation, um, I think it probably has a huge impact. Of course, in addition, you know, a lot of what's happened with that testing has now turned around um, because um, the patent on that um, test has now been overturned and so that multiple places will be able to do this testing. So I think in some ways those two things converging at the same time are going to have a huge impact on um, testing for the BRCA1-2 genes. Um, thanks for that question. I actually saw the episode last night on Special Victims Unit. Uh, I'm an avid watcher of the show, primarily because the female detective, Olivia Benson, um, is she's a Special Victims Unit officer, but she's also a daughter, a, a child of rape, right? And so I always imagine you know, she's the ideal police officer that someone would go to um, when they're telling their story. The actor who played the police officer is actually her husband in real life, so there's, so there's like something interesting there. But um, <laughs> side point, I was like, wow, that's weird, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, that's good. But, um, but your question, I think, uh, the case that they were showing was based on a, a case in New York City two years ago when they actually did try to prosecute a police officer who was accused of sexually assaulting a woman in Brooklyn, right? And so he, w he was found not guilty. So it was based, you know, that's how they do it on the show. But I think what's important about your question and what's important about the episode is that these, when it, the person's in a position of authority, like a police officer, it points to two things. There's this great book called Sex and World Peace that's out right now. And what it, after studying 265 countries um, and, uh, the way that women and girls are treated, what the conclusion of the book is that you can tell uh, a country's likelihood for peace and its likelihood for democracy based on its treatment of girls and women, right? So it's radically redefining what we think of as development, what we think of as national security, and what we think of as kind of just prosperity for a country. And why that's important is because right now in the U.S. military, in, in the bill that Kirsten Gillibrand is really trying to pass is so crucial because you have military officers um, men and women who are experiencing high levels of sexual violence being unable to seek redress in the military court and they're not able to go anywhere else, right? Um, and so this is why if we think about um, ending sexual violence as actually an act of patriotism mm -hmm. as opposed to something that's just pushed under the rug is how we kind of tend to think about it, that if we change our understanding of violence against girls and women as crucial to our understanding and practice of democracy, um, then we would actually have a different judicial system and actually have a different military system around these things, right? So I just want to point out that all of that Special Victims Unit episode is speaking to a larger issue. And if we're really a democratic country, then this issue wouldn't just be something that should be high on the list, but actually crucial or fundamental to our expression and our practice of democracy, both here and then when we try to export it abroad. So that's my... Uh, okay, so I was anorexia and bulimia. This must be what it's like to be a broadcast anchor. It's like you just have to go from, you know, and now the weather. Um, so, okay, uh, shifting gears. So anorexia and bulimia, I think they're very uh, interesting cases because people might say, well, you know, I want my daughter to be self-controlled, but not too self-controlled because then she might have these pathologies. 
I would argue, and I'm not a clinician, but I would argue that actually eating disorders like anorexia and bulimia are not examples of having lots and lots of self-control. Actually, many of these women are uh, tortured by this compulsion, actually, to, to not eat or to throw up after eating. So, so the definition of self-control is the pursuit of goals that are subjectively, enduringly valued in the face of momentary temptations that just make you feel good in the moment. So because anorexia and bulimia are not sort of the way these women want to be, typically, right, and there's a little bit of an insight problem, I think, particularly for the younger women, but many of them actually, they don't want to be this. It's sort of the, the opposite. Now, they use a lot of these strategies. They use a lot of cognitive reframing and modifying their situation, but it's all under this perverse thing. So I would argue that there's some features that are superficially similar to self-control, but they're not. And statistics when we look at our data and we say, okay, let's look at the top 1% of our kids in self-control, and we have really big samples, thousands of kids, we actually find that they manifest fewer psychopathologies. They are less depressed. They are less anxious. They have fewer dis eating, eating disorders. So it seems to be generally adaptive. Uh, but I keep an open mind to everything because, you know, some things that we must have said have been wrong because that's the way science and, and research proceed. I, I just want to add to this from the world I'm in. I know that um, there's a lot of interest right now in thinking about on the other end of the spectrum obesity and its relationship to violence that young girls have experienced right so I, there's a big push with Robert Wood Johnson right now from the Novo Foundation to sort of think about what we think of as whether it's physiological or sci or biological responses to think about the early trauma that a girl experiences and the way that she responds to that through another form of controlling her body right so so i think if we like also add yeah, look kind of, the roots of these things. Then right? maybe yeah. it would also help us understand what control and self-control means. I'm just yeah, yeah just for sure, absolutely. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, for Dr. Emanuel. You said that um, in the future, possibly, we could be encoded with a chip in our bodies. Yeah. What if a person who objects to being encoded with a chip and on that trend? Um, how about a credit card, like um, we could go to a bar, meet someone, take the little credit card over to that machine, find out if we have recessive genes, shove it in their ATM, and um, we know whether or not we want to have a date with this person. When, when I said he has uh, cystic fibrosis, uh, bipolar conditions, schizoaffective, um, uh, fragile X, I mean, you know, just on and on. Um, actually, when I said chip, I sort of was thinking of the credit card, not embedded in, you don't need to embed it in yourself, I mean, you've got it in yourself. Um, so the, the idea, you know, it's a little far-fetched, but we've all sort of heard about this, at least those in genetics, you know, once your genome is sequenced, it's sequenced. And so you need to find a way, there should be ways to store that data because someone may want to call it up later and take a look and see, okay, can we find this, that, or the other. And, you know, this is going to be a dynamic process um, because even though we say today um, you might be able to do a genome sequence and predict disease A, you don't know that sometime down the road, disease B may be uncovered, and that individual, um, nobody looked at the gene for disease B that we now know. So why have to do that testing over and over? That's the idea of being able to catalog it in a way that would become a part of your record, if you will, because you don't want to have to do it over and over. It's too time consuming, too costly, et cetera. Um, I don't know about cards in a bar and <laughs> <laughs> dating. <laughs> you need the you need the right card reader at the time. So yeah. yeah. Um, questions for Dr. Tillett. Um, I wanted to thank you for sharing your story and thought that was really amazing. Um, I work with Hollaback Philly, and so we're all about sharing our stories around street harassment. Um, and I was wondering if you would talk a little bit, bit about that awesome shirt that you're wearing and uh, about reframing the conversation around consent <laughs> and Thank the challenges you. in no, that. great. So I was kind of like unclear exactly. Now I'm here and I'm like, oh, these are such fabulous women. I wasn't sure if it was college or, you know, so 
point being that I wear this when I'm performing with our organization, um, but uh, consent is something. Uh, last week I was in Brockport, uh, in Rochester, New York, at the College of Brockport, and there was an interesting question in the audience. I was talking about this, and someone asked me, well, what is rape, right? And so I was like, kind of thrown off, even though I talk about this stuff all the time, and I was like, oh, okay, so like, I have to explain what rape is. And then I realized, like, actually, you also need to know what consent is, because I think that is part of what's oftentimes missing from conversations. I mean, you, you do this work all the time, too. But that you know, feminist or anti-rape activist, they're always kind of labeled as people who aren't talking about pleasure and aren't talking about sex in a positive way. But also, talking about consent, I think, helps us shift the conversation from only talking about trauma to talking about the ways in which we can actually prevent trauma. And, and that's the work that we're interested in doing. So even though the organization that Longworkham started from the place of trauma, we're really interested in doing preventive work and, and having our students really think cru critically and crucially about consent is part of that. And also think about pleasure, right? Um, and I always give this like stat to people that there was a study done at Rutgers University um, about who were the like most likely groups to enjoy sex, and it was actually like the feminist activists on campus. And so I just try to like plug like you know feminist <laughs> women who like are for women's rights actually are for good sex too. And so and and obviously if you promote consent, you're actually trying to have the most pleasurable sexual experience possible. So that's. My little got consent. <laughs> yeah, it says got oh, consent. it's like got consent. Yeah, it's like. The <laughs> um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Teller and Dr. Duckworth. Have you ever considered applying um, um, your research on self-control to the fight against violence against women, and kind of reframing it as against instead of um, like blaming the victim or changing the victim, but self-control for the aggressor? Or, or the whole society. The, the shortest answer for that would be no. I had never thought about that at all. Although, you know, the um, the the idea that self-control and the lack thereof, really, was the underlying deficit for all of criminality, not just sexual assault, but pickpocketing and murder and other crimes against humanity um, is a very old theory. So there are these two researchers named Gottfriedson and Hershey, and they, they said that that's what all criminals have in common. And actually, there's still a great many criminologists today who believe that that is the core deficit in criminal behavior, the inability to suppress impulses that are immediately pleasurable, rewarding, but but bad. And and so, um, so I haven't thought about that. And I actually really, um, I'm a former school teacher, so I, like, like ninety percent of my work is in schools with kids, so we actually have not crossed paths with, um, you know, folks like you. Although maybe we should. Yeah, no, that was actually when she was doing her presentation. Obviously, I was thinking a lot about the idea that perpetrators. So it's interesting that that's like still a kind of understanding in criminology, whereas I think sort of, you know, people who are interested in ending violence against girls and women, um, kind of think about the power and control dynamic between a perpetrator and a victim, and whether it's an act of um, a lack of self-control or whether it's something else, right? So I think that it would be interesting to have the there conversation. May not be that you know, yeah. If I want to and I don't want to. Or, to yeah, and I think that's part of what, like, I guess, you know, 1970s feminists were really trying to debunk that is that like rape is an inevitable natural act of male aggression that maybe that there's something else going on in our larger society that enables an individual to understand that they can do this and i think on college campuses they also or just in general you also know you can get away with it so i think there's something not in the moment the person's thinking about it, but as part of one's upbringing that makes all of this kind of it, not inconsequential but something that one can do and have no consequences for it. so, but I think it's it's a really good question because it's. Yeah. I was thinking about that topic. And, and I saw many more hands, but this hour flew by. <laughs> I was aware of the time last, and I would just like to thank the three of you for being here. Thank you so much, and I invite everyone to join us in the classroom for a wine reception. Um, please take the time to see our historical display um, documenting the Association of Alumni and Country of Service at the University of Columbia. And also check out our
for being our spontaneous. <laughs> <laughs>